Well, good evening, everyone. I'm glad you can be joining us tonight. Uh, we're going to have a Q&A uh, right now, and that's an opportunity where you've been able to put in some questions, and now the pastors will be answering them, and then after that, we'll go to the sermon. So here we have our Q&A. Good evening, church. Uh, welcome to the Q&A section of our evening service. This is been the third time now that we've gotten to do this and getting to have the pastors answer some of your burning questions. There's a lot of them, so without further preamble, let's get into your questions. Firstly, we were wondering if there was a way to facilitate a communion service online. Sunday night's sermon really highlighted the importance of visual reminders and given restrictions. We are not sure this could be done. Gentlemen, do any of you have a potential way that we could do communion online and what the ramifications of online communion would be. Nathan, mm. over to you. Uh, yeah, I guess just first acknowledging there are a lot of churches that are doing it at the moment, the virtual communion. We've landed on not doing it uh, as of yet. I think if we were just left with the passage that Christ gives us on doing it in remembrance of him, I think that would give us a bit of freedom. But what we get in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11 really is quite prescriptive on what's required uh, for doing it. So I think in 1 Corinthians 10, where he says, uh, there, because there is, one, uh, there is one bread, we who are many are one body because we partake of the one bread. Uh, so really communion is supposed to show our unity. So for example, if we do it online uh, and we're not together, that actu- the actual ordinance loses its loses its imagery, loses its, uh, its point, really, and its purpose. Um, some have actually said, you know, but aren't we, even though we're physically uh, absent from each other, we're spiritually together. But I think the point of the Lord's Supper is uh, when we gather to have it, that's what shows our spiritual unity. I think that's the point of 1 Corinthians 10, that gathering together to eat it shows our spiritual unity. And also in chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians Five times he says, when you come together, when you come together. And if anything was wrong with the Corinthians, he kept saying, you don't wait for each other. You're not doing it together. You're not together when you have it. So I think that was a big problem. So if we actually, if we actually did it while we're not physically together, um, I think that goes against the prescriptive nature of it. So I feel like we are bound because of those directions that we get there. But if, it, if we had... BCGs or other things, gatherings together, that's a different question, so maybe we could answer that next time. But as far as online, not being together, I think it's kind of ruled out from Scripture. Sure. I think that's very well covered. So, question two, uh, and this, this is going to be an interesting one. Is the church leadership aware of the situation at John MacArthur's Grace Community Church? Does the church leadership hold any thoughts on the situation and is their response biblically sound? Could this kind of response to COVID restrictions theoretically become something that CHBC would follow? Uh, We are aware of the John MacArthur situation. Uh, We've all had an opportunity to have a look at it, but I think we are agreed in being reluctant to make any commentary on it simply because Uh, It's an American context, Uh, the kind of lockdown that they are experiencing is different to ours. The constitution of America is different to what it is in Australia. Uh, And so it's very difficult to comment at a distance for something like that. So I I think it would be unfair on John MacArthur, unfair on the church, unfair on us even, to start making comments of a situation we're not really part of, we're not really aware of. And it's out of our completely out of our context. So I think it's it's best probably just to uh, leave it with John MacArthur. He's got to do what he believes he is convicted before the Lord. But that might look very different to what we do. Sure. Wow. Cool. We're going through them quite quickly. Number three. Uh, we know that Catholics commonly ask for intercession through dead people, Mary or other saints. Is there any biblical basis for doing this? Isn't this essentially the same as asking a friend to pray for you? Yep, oh, my turn. Um, I guess 1 Timothy 2 shows there's one mediator between God and man. Um, So he's the only one we can come to uh, in prayer. And I guess there's a big difference between going to a friend and asking them for prayer. We can 
talk to a friend, we can't talk to dead people. And there's no mm. indication in the Bible that we can. So I think it's a big difference. It's not like we're talking to a friend when we're praying to a dead person. It's mm. very different. Mm. So I think that would be the main thing I would say. Mm. And even with that, we don't... Um, we're given nothing in Scripture that the dead can even hear us. Mm. So that's one thing. I also even add to that. Some of the people that we might choose to pray to, we can't be assured that they're actually in heaven. So that could be greatly problematic, even if they somehow could hear us. You don't know where that person for certain actually is, so why would you risk it? Um, mm. It presents some big problems that scripture kind of, that's, that's it, yeah, yeah, what you're saying. Um, yeah. No direction there from scripture, that's mm. for sure. Mm. Excellent. Number four. So Romans 7 finishes with the famous words, Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The section talks about the struggle against sin. New Testament scholar Douglas Moo states this section is talking about Jews who do not know Christ or unbelievers. Who is this section referring to? Believers or unbelievers? I'm happy to kick this off, but I'll, I'll let the other guys add to this. Um, look, it's a, it's a difficult passage. There are varying views that come out from different commentators. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones preached on this passage, and uh, he was fairly clear that his understanding of what was being said there was definitely directed towards believers. Mm -hmm. And I think if you, if you read the passage through and you take out those... Uh, perhaps those external spectacles you wear on what different commentators say, I think it makes the most sense in its context, speaking about the struggle that believers have with sin. And, and we have all experienced this, where we do things we don't want to do and we don't do the things that we ought to do. And uh, there's this internal cry, you know, why can't we, we get this right uh, all of the time? And of course, it's impossible to get right all, all of the time. So when I read that passage, I see it specifically referring uh, to believe is the struggle that we have with sin. And in fact, when Paul gets to the end of that section, he says, who will rescue us from this body of death? Thanks be to God uh, who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. What he's actually saying there is the rescue that comes is death. Death rescues us finally from this body and we go into the presence of God where we experience the, the, the mm. victory forever. So my, my take on that passage is it is, is a wrestle that believers have in this current world with sin. You guys, please feel free to add. Mm. Mm. No, I, I would agree with that. Like, and I think with verse 25 where he's, and 24 where he says, you know, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ who has rescued me. And then he goes, therefore or so then, I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law but in the sinful nature of slave to the law of sin. So he goes back to the argument he's been making again after that. Some people would say at verse 25 he switches to maybe salvation and that leads into Romans 8, but it doesn't work because straight after he goes back to that argument. So I would agree with that. And even maybe in, um, I guess in Romans 8, it sort of links when he's going on about how the, he wants to be, we should be groaning to be free uh, from this life. Mm. That, that groaning is similar to Romans 7, really. So the, the two chapters aren't separate. I, I think they do link. Mm. Yeah together yeah you know I've studied both positions and I've landed on the same mm. I think it's referring to believers and I think it's one of God's gifts that mm. passage because mm. we don't get a whole lot of that from Paul we often see him as living this really high standard but I think the Holy Spirit's preserved despite all these evidences of context I think mm. I think that's how it functions this is the believers struggle mm. the spirit is willing the flesh is weak the spirit lusts against mm. the flesh uh, and the flesh against the spirit so there's these you know, this battle rages against each other. I think that summarizes it there. Fantastic. Uh, only 25 to go, guys. So we're making... No. It's only two to go. <laughs> two to go. Uh, how can one move through the Christian life navigating legalism and licentiousness to reflect an ideal Christian life? Very pointed phrase at the end, I think. Um, I, I would simply say that, and, and the, I would simply say, and then I'll hand over to these two, that you've got to avoid both extremes. Um, I think the danger is that you either, as a Christian, and I was watching last night a, a series on TV on Scientology, but they were looking at Jehovah Witnesses. And I said to Janice at the end of watching that first section, what scared me were the similarities between what are asked of Jehovah Witnesses and what are asked of Christians. Mm. 
mm. and and the the when with the similarities are the, the things that you know sometimes in application and sermons we will encourage people to do there's a very fine line between ending up in a legalistic position where you're getting people simply to say I've got to obey a bunch of rules and they end up becoming burdened by the legalism and we place on them burdens that the Pharisees placed on the Israelites who added a whole lot of extra laws to the laws that God had already given. The other side to that is if you don't in some sense and and James talks about obeying the royal law that gives freedom and so in chapter 3 so if you don't uh, then if, if you just dismiss the law out of hand and say, well, you know, we can just live any way we want because we're under grace now. And Paul deals with that in Romans. He says, should we sin so that grace should increase? And Paul says, mm. no, we shouldn't sin so that grace should increase. That doesn't understand grace. And it just kind of cuts across what grace is. And it, 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 it's an insult to God to do that. So you don't want to go to the extreme of, of saying, well, you know, I'm free from legalism, I'm free from the law, I can just do whatever I want to yeah. do, and I can live a licentious life. No, the balance is that through the Spirit's help, as we surrender ourselves more and more to Christ, and as the Lordship of Christ takes more and more hold in our lives, and as we hand over our lives, and this should be a daily exercise to the Lord Jesus Christ, so that the life of Christ in us becomes more and more evidence and we begin to live according to who we are in Christ and we are new we are new creations we have an identity now that is linked to the Lord Jesus Christ and that identity then becomes more and more prominent in the way we live and that balance comes in so why do I obey God not because I've got a bunch of rules but because that's who I am in Christ and so I love to do the things of God I want to do those things and when I don't do those things it grieves me because the Holy Spirit is living in me. Mm-hmm. And so he, he, he inspires me and he causes me to want to live in a way that is in conformity to the will of God. But I'm not doing this out of a legalistic, I have to do this and I've been a bad bunch of rules. And then I don't want to go to the licentious route because I don't want to say, well, God's grace is just means I can do whatever I want and I'll just run to God for forgiveness and there's forgiveness and, and so I'm okay. Because if I live a licentious life, then I am actually... Um, s- taking the grace of God and turning it into something that it's not Mm. and I'm disrespecting God I'm dishonoring God and I'm cheapening the grace of God and I'm cheapening the death of the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross Mm. and I don't want to do that so I think when you realize who you are and you live according to who you are and the spirit empowers you to do that and it's a daily submitting to the Lordship of Christ then you'll get that balance right I think, a, yeah, I think a big way, too, to get that tension right is just being faithful to God's Word. Like, it goes certain ways at times, and we need to not uh, take away from the, the weight of God's Word at different points when it speaks on things. And even, like, I guess one way is not rushing to a certain passage. We, we might want to rush to bring in the Gospel when that might actually do away with the weight of that passage and the call for holiness on our lives. But then, as well, at other points, we, not, we might need to uh, be careful to see that the Gospel really does... Um, uh, allow the strength to do what that call is. Um, mm. I think, like in uh, it's in one Peter chapter two, verse twenty-four, it says about Christ: He bore our sins in His body on the tree, that we might die to sins and live to righteousness. So, the gospel and what Christ has done allows us to be able to live a holy life. So, we've got to, I think, get that tension by being faithful to God's word, because God gets that tension right. So, mm. be faithful to what He says. Yeah. I, I love the question. I think it's something we all wrestle with. Maybe, maybe just in a practical way, just kind of asking where are we at on the two ends of the spectrum? So kind of whoever's listening, do I lean towards the legalism side? Do I only have happiness and, and kind of confidence of my salvation when I've ticked all these things for the day? Uh, so if I haven't read today, uh, do I all of a sudden feel that I've, I'm not in Christ and that I might be going to hell? Uh, if, if you fall into that category, you could be leaning towards the legalism side. But on the other hand, uh, you might want to ask yourself the question, am I, heavenly, am I a heavenly-minded person? So when people talk to me, is the majority of my conversation about the things of the world? Um, is that where I gain most pleasure? Is that what excites me the most? Then I might be living a licentious, worldly life, and I, I might be in danger here. So I guess for each person, it's helpful to ask, where, where do I fit on the scale? Um, I find that helpful for me working out where I'm going. Excellent. Last one, gentlemen. Uh, Still probably going to be uh, not a quick one. So (laughs) Timothy 
chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Where do you sit in relation to women leading a Bible study? I am going to kick this off uh, only because I've preached through that passage. And if you were here in the morning, and so can I encourage you, uh, if you weren't here in the morning service when I did preach through that passage, to actually mm. go and get the CD. We still have it. It's still online. And I, I really did try and deal with those issues. But let me just speak to it again. I think one's got to be it's a, it, very careful here because there are, even amongst complementarians, there are different understandings of how Bible studies function and, and what role women can or can't play in a Bible study. And, and so one doesn't want to be too dogmatic at this point. But if I understand 1 Timothy 2 correctly, and not just chapter, uh, not verse 12, but 13 and 14, then what Paul is arguing is he's saying that where there's a formal process of teaching taking place, so whether that's in a church situation where you've got a congregation, or whether that's in a home situation where you've got a small segment of the congregation of the church and someone is leading that and they are doing the bulk of the teaching in that context in that situation then it is confined to a male if you're dealing with someone who is uh, coordinating a Bible study so they're not acting as the primary teacher in that sense but they may just be coordinating in sense of going through a number of questions in a book and everyone's contributing and then you move on to the next question so they're not the ones who are doing the bulk of the teaching I can at that point uh, live with someone who is not a male that is a woman who is performing that kind of a role but if in a study they are doing the bulk of the teaching then that is confined mm. to a male Mm. Now please add, guys. I guess the only thing to add is that's obviously in a mixed Bible study. Yes. If it's just women, then that would be quite different and they would be able to teach. Yes. Or if it's young children too. Yes. And that would be different. True. And they'd be able to teach. Yeah. Yeah, so some, some Bible studies, BCG groups are quite, te are quite teaching heavy. So it's one person doing the teaching, people chiming in, answering questions. But then some other Bible studies are, are purely facilitating. So they have a discussion guide, someone's just leading the questions, and that might be a woman, and then everyone's contributing. There's this equal contribution where we all, and I think that's, that's fine, it's that real exercise of authority, of proclam proclaiming and teaching the Word of God, bringing the group in submission to the Word of God under your teaching. I think that's problematic to what... Yeah. Too, so yeah. That, yeah. Um, but yeah, totally agree. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, again, we really appreciate not only uh, your preaching and the way that you do teach this church, but also uh, being able to bring questions to you in this format. And hopefully all of you at home are being challenged by this. Um, please keep thinking of questions to ask these guys. Unfortunately, we're probably going to be sticking with this format for a little while longer. So please keep trying to connect with the church through these opportunities. Ian mentioned uh, the sermon that he preached. I will do my best to make sure that I link it in the description. So if you're on YouTube, uh, you will be able to get a link to that podcast so that you can hear that one as well. Thank you again, gents. And now we're going to have Pastor Will with the sermon. Well, the passage we're looking at tonight is Joshua chapter 5, verse 1 to 12, as we continue in our series through Joshua. So turn there, Joshua chapter 5, and please read along with me and be looking at your Bibles as we go through this sermon. Joshua chapter 5, verse 1 to 12. Now, when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over. Their hearts melted, and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. Now this is why he did so. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people that came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years until all the men who were of military age when they left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. <clears throat> 
For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. So he raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal till this day. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, the Israelites celebrated the Passover. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. Let's pray. Our great and awesome God, we thank you for the God that you are. We lift you up and praise you that you are a God who has been gracious and merciful to us. We thank you for that mercy and that forgiveness that we have found in Christ, that we know in him through his sacrifice and through his death. And we thank you so much for this, God. And we thank you that we have access to you now, that we can speak with you, that we can be your people, and that we can receive all the good that comes in being united to Christ. We thank you for what he has done. We thank you for the future hope that we have. And we pray, God, as your people, that you would help us to live in light of this future hope, that you would help us to store up treasures in heaven and to wait for that eternal weight of glory that is coming. Please, God, we pray that you would cause us to be citizens of heaven that would live looking forward to what is to come. And we pray, God, that you would help us as we do this to be a light to those around us, that you would cause us to be your witnesses as we live not for this world, but as we look forward to what is to come, as we take great hope in the gospel and what you have done, may we be a light And may you cause us to speak of this hope to others. And we pray, God, that through your word tonight, you would equip us to do this more. And we pray, God, that you would grow our trust in you and that you would cause in us holy lives that would honor you. Please do this through your word for your glory. Amen. If you are anything like me and most people in our society, we rush around trying to quickly get things done. We want to be swift, speedy, and efficient in what we do. We want to rush into starting another ministry or serving in another one. We want to pump out the things that we're doing in life. There's pressure to perform. There is a pressure to be successful. There are deadlines and we need to get cracking and start doing things. And we want to quickly as well receive the benefits and blessings from God that can come from the things we do. But imagine if we were in the Israelite situation in Joshua 5. Imagine if we were in the Israelite situation here. They had been stuck in slavery in Egypt and then God had set them free. They had crossed the Red Sea only to find themselves wandering in the wilderness for 40 years because of their sin. Now by a miracle, they've crossed the Jordan River and they're ready to take the promised land and receive the covenant blessings that God promised hundreds of years ago. Surely the urge to go into battle would have been huge. Surely they would have wanted to rush in and take what God had promised. This is what they'd been waiting for, to go in and take the land, the promised land that was flowing with milk and honey, all these good things. And the enemy is frightened. And the people are ready to fight. And all the motivation to take the land is right before them. Surely now's the time. Surely now is the time. But God wasn't thinking this. He had his own time and he had preparations that first had to happen. Something is even more important than them rushing into the land and taking it and conquering it and serving God in that way. God doesn't rush his people into battle, but he slows them down and he prepares them for the great tasks ahead of them. 
And we need to pause and prepare too before rushing into the tasks God has ahead of us. We think the quicker we do things, the better. We run around in life always so busy, rushing from one thing to the next. But in our passage tonight, we need to see that there are some necessary things that must happen before rushing into the things God has ahead of us as we serve him. We need to prepare before rushing into our to-do lists. So the big question we answer tonight is, what were the necessary preparations Israel had to undergo? And what must happen before we rush into the tasks ahead of us? Well, there are four points we have as we work through the passage. Firstly, God must prepare the way. The verse before our passage, Joshua chapter 4, verse 24, says this, He did this so that all the peoples of the earth might know that the hand of the Lord is powerful and so that you might always fear the Lord your God. Up to this point, God has been working in powerful ways. The people of Israel have just crossed the Jordan River in flood season and God has allowed it as he cleared the water for them. And he has done it so the nations would know that he is powerful and so that his people would fear him and therefore trust him. And verse one of our passage shows it has worked. It says, Now when all the Amorite kings west of the Jordan and all the Canaanite kings along the coast heard how the Lord had dried up the Jordan before the Israelites until we had crossed over, their hearts melted and they no longer had the courage to face the Israelites. The nations have seen great miracles and they are in fear of the Lord. They have never seen anything like this. God is like no other. None compare to him in what he can do. God is powerful and he is to be feared and these nations do. There are two lessons here for us. Firstly, God works so that people will fear him and know his power. Again and again in the Bible, we see God works so powerfully so that his glory and majesty would be over this world. And so that people would know he is the Lord. And so as we look at what happens in this fragile world, may it bring fear in people and may we see God's power. He is over all that happens. Our hearts should melt before God as we see all that God can do. He could and rightfully should wipe us out for our rebellion. But in his mercy, he hasn't. And how we should be in awe of God at his power and his mercy. The second lesson here for us is that we need to trust God to prepare the way for what he has ahead. God prepared the nations by taking their courage so that Israel could come and conquer. In a real sense, the nations and Israel knew that God had already conquered. They knew because of his power. And we need to see that God has conquered to ready us for what is in store in this life and to ready us to trust him in this life. John 16 verse 33, in this passage, Jesus says, In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We need to trust that God has conquered And we need to let him prepare the way ahead. Well, the nations here in this first verse, they are in fear. And you would think that now is the time for the Israelites to attack and go and take the land while the enemy is in fear. But God still has more important things to do. And we see the next preparation come. What must happen next? What must happen next? What's the next preparation? Well, it is the fact that we must be God's holy people. This is needed before rushing into the tasks ahead. Verse 2 to 3, Joshua 5, verse 2 to 3, it says, At that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make flint knives and circumcise the Israelites again. 
So Joshua made flint knives and circumcised the Israelites at Gibeath Haraloth. Now that name there means the hill of foreskins, which makes sense with what happens. Circumcision in the Old Testament was a sign of the covenant that God had made with Abraham and his descendants. Genesis chapter 17 tells us about it. It says in verse 10 to 11, This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you, the covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. And then verse 12 goes on to say that every male in Israel was to be circumcised when they were eight days old. So God commanded circumcision hundreds of years ago before this chapter, hundreds of years before Israel comes to this point. So why is Israel being circumcised again? It's because the Israelites had not done it while they wandered in the wilderness. And now there was an uncircumcised generation. You would think that Moses would have learnt from his own experience and mistakes. After he had spoken, Moses, after he'd spoken with God at the burning bush, he heads back to Egypt to undertake the task God has given him and to set God's people free out of Egypt. But on his way, he is stopped in his tracks by the Lord and he's about to be put to death because his sons hadn't been circumcised. He hadn't continued the sign of the covenant with God and so he was not fit for God's service in this way. Yet even with this near-death experience for Moses, he didn't ensure that the Israelites were circumcised in the wilderness. He didn't learn from his failures and he neglected this important aspect in their covenant with God. And we are like Moses. We go on and on sometimes without doing the simple things that God has commanded. And we ignore him, though we should know better. We hide the gospel in our homes and to ourselves. When we are told to be a light on a hill, we refuse to get baptized when God commands it. We buy bigger houses, better cars, We want more luxuries for our lives and constantly live to just please ourselves when God says, sell your possessions and give to the poor. Seek first God's kingdom. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. And we barely read God's word, even though we know it is so good that it is sweeter than honey and that is like living bread. May God change us to not be like Moses and may he change us to do the simple things that we know he wants us to do. We need his help to do this. Well, Moses had neglected the circumcision of the Israelites. And so now we're seeing verse two, it says, they needed to be circumcised again. Now the word again here is important. It's not saying that those who are circumcised will be again, they couldn't. But it's saying that those who aren't need to be circumcised. And it is being done again with the nation Israel because the covenant sign must be re-established with the nation. This is why it's something that is happening again. The covenant sign here is being re-established. Verse four and the following verses go on to explain this. Verse four and five, have a look there. Now this is why he did so. It's explaining why Joshua had the people circumcised. This is why he did so, verse 4. All those who came out of Egypt, all the men of military age, died in the desert on the way after leaving Egypt. All the people who came out had been circumcised, but all the people born in the desert during the journey from Egypt had not. Those of military age had all died in the wilderness. This was because they had not obeyed God and they were afraid to go into battle when the spies had been sent in Numbers 14. And they were afraid to go and take that land and go into battle. And so now in Joshua 5, Israel consisted of those who would have been under military age at that time, back in Numbers 14. But it also consisted of many who had been born in the wilderness as they wandered for 40 years after that time. And those people had not been circumcised. Verse 6 further explains this. It says, The Israelites had moved about in the desert 40 years. 
until all the men who were of military age when they had left Egypt had died, since they had not obeyed the Lord. For the Lord had sworn to them that they would not see the land that he had solemnly promised their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. How is it that God who solemnly promised to give the land has later swore to not give it to some of these people, as verse 6 says? Well, it's because the covenant had conditions. God who solemnly promised to Israel's fathers, that he would give their descendants the land flowing with milk and honey, also swears that the generation in the wilderness would not see the land because they disobeyed him and failed to exercise faith. And maybe this is why circumcision hadn't happened in the wilderness. The sign of their covenant with God couldn't come because God's anger was being shown on his people as they wandered in the wilderness. Clearly, the covenant they have with God had conditions, the condition of faith and obedience to Him. We saw one of those conditions back in Genesis 17, circumcision, and we'll see it a little more soon. The covenant had conditions. And and is the New Testament any different? Look at John. Look at the New Testament in John Chapter 3, verse 36, it says, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the Son will not see life, for God's wrath remains on him. And John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will obey obey what I command. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. And John 15, verse 10, so clearly, If you obey my commands, you will obey. Remain in my love. And Hebrews 12 verse 14, Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The New Testament gives these conditions, yet somehow these conditions don't contradict God's grace and are not promoting salvation by keeping God's law. We must remember that the conditions of the covenant that are given in the commandments to Israel are given after he redeems them from Egypt. God redeems his people and then he expects this certain way of life. He redeemed them and then he gives them the commandments. And God redeems us. He redeems us to create a holy people that are zealous for good works, as Titus 2 says. And we are only able to do this, only able to live holy lives because in the new covenant, we have God's spirit in us. God's law is written on our hearts. We are first redeemed. And then if we are redeemed and if God's spirit is in us and if God's law is written on our hearts, then we will be made into holy people through the power of his spirit. So, Back to Joshua, here we see that the sin of these people back in the wilderness, before the wilderness happened, their sin caused them to miss out in the covenant blessings. And now God has raised up their children to take their place instead. Have a look, Joshua 5 verse 7. So God raised up their sons in their place, and these were the ones Joshua circumcised. They were still uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So God fulfills his covenant to Abraham in the nation of Israel. He eventually fulfills it here. But this doesn't mean that every person received the covenant blessings. It didn't mean that every Israelite in history received the covenant blessings. A faith that acted was necessary to receive these blessings. Those in the wilderness perish because they did not have this and a new generation was raised up in their place to receive these covenant blessings. But something had to happen to this generation before they could take the land and before they could receive these blessings. They had to renew their covenant with God and God had to grow faith and obedience in them. That's what Joshua 5 is about. If they were to go and take the land, then they had to be 
circumcised. And if they were to go and take the land without being circumcised and without being in covenant with with God, then they would be cut off from being God's people. That's what Genesis 17 verse 14 says. It said, any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Circumcision is a sign of the covenant and an act of obedience. So those without it couldn't experience God's promises. And so here, this is why this new generation had to be circumcised and renew their covenant with God. And this is now a new beginning for Israel. They are making a new start and they're being careful to obey God and the conditions put on them in this covenant. And after all of this, after this circumcision happens, verse 8 says, understandably, it says, and after the whole nation had been circumcised, they remained where they were in camp until they were healed. God's timing in all of this is so clear. He has Israel immobilized because of circumcision at a time when the nations are paralyzed by their fear of God and what he can do, as verse 1 showed us. God knows what he's doing. But also, what deep trust would have been needed by Israel to be circumcised at this time when they were surrounded by enemies? The men of Israel would have been unable to fight for days or even weeks, and the nation would have been vulnerable to attack. And so a deep trust in God was necessary here to be circumcised and listen to God's command while they were surrounded by the enemy. And this was all necessary before they served God, before they entered the promised land. And so what do we learn here? Well, we learn we must be in covenant with God before serving him. We must be God's holy people to serve him. Sin must be removed and we must identify with him as his follower. Our holiness as well is so key before we get on with serving God or running to doing things. Clear disobedience characterized the Israelites and it had to be dealt with. And it has to be dealt with in our lives too if we are to serve God. It has to be dealt with. Do we do this with people that we may even bring into ministry or when we may go into ministry? Do we do this with people that we bring into God's service? Do we check that there isn't some gaping hole in their obedience? Do we ensure that they are God's holy people or do we just throw anyone into God's service? And as well, how much thought and diligence do we put into pursuing holiness in our own lives? God is serious about holiness and we need to be too the people around us and the countless things that we do in life they all desperately need your holiness this is what they most need from you because holy living and living like God will change how you do all those things and it will change how you treat all those people around you And unholy living affects our service to God and affects our lives. Unholy lives are fatal. We could read many verses to show this, but let me read one that shows that it is eternally fatal. Hebrews 12 verse 14 says, I mentioned it before, it says, Make every effort to live in peace with all men and to be holy. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. We must pursue holiness. And we need to realize that Jesus died to bring about holiness in us. Titus 2 verse 14 says that Jesus gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Holiness is key, and God is serious about our holiness. Well, let's continue on this big question. What must happen before rushing into the task ahead? What must happen in Israel before they go in to take the promised land? Well, the third thing we see is that reproach must be removed. Have a look at Joshua 5 verse 9. Then the Lord said to Joshua, 
Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the place has been called Gilgal to this day. What is the reproach or criticism that has been removed? Well, it's very closely linked to circumcision. And through circumcision, they have been shown that they belong to God and that they are his people. They are no longer slaves of Egypt. They are slaves to God and he has delivered them and he has brought them out and he has brought them into the promised land. As Israel wandered in the wilderness, their decision to leave Egypt would have looked quite foolish and it would have looked as though their God had abandoned them and he was punishing them at this time. But now as they were entering the promised land, as they were going to take what God had promised them, all that is behind them. All the reproach and the criticism that could have come upon them and was upon them as they wandered in the wilderness because of their sin is behind them. And it's rolled away. That's the idea of the word Gilgal. It's that literal meaning of the word Gilgal. That reproach, that criticism is rolled away. And this was so necessary before they entered the promised land and before they came to serve God as his people in this land. And the removal of of reproach is essential also in our service to God. In Titus and Timothy, elders are told to be above reproach. And this really is the calling upon all mature Christians, all of God's servants. Our witness and service of God can be destroyed when our lives do not match up what we say and when our private lives are hypocritical. We need reproach to be removed before undertaking what God has ahead of us and before we run into his service. We need consistent lives with what we believe before we rush into his service. It's so important. And then finally, what must happen before we rush into the tasks ahead or rush into serving God? Fourth thing, we must remember our redemption. Verse 10 says, On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, The Israelites celebrated the Passover. The Israelites had first celebrated the Passover, as you know, back when they went to leave Egypt and they celebrated the Passover and it was a reminder for them of how God had spared their firstborn sons from dying while the Egyptians died. And it was also a reminder of how redemption had occurred and how they had been brought out of Egypt and out of slavery And this is what we need before serving God too. We need a reminder like this. And for us, the equivalent of the Passover is the Lord's Supper where we remember Jesus' death. 1 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Our redemption, our redemption from slavery to sin has come through Christ. And that redemption... And that forgiveness that we have in Christ, it's the only thing that can fuel our service to God. And it must be something that is at the forefront of our minds as we go into service for God and as we go into the tasks ahead in this life. Remembering how God has loved us will help us to love sacrificially. Remembering how God forgives us, empowers us to forgive others others because we have been forgiven of such great debt. How could we not forgive the small debts others may owe against us? Remembering that Jesus made himself poor by humbling himself to the point of giving his life in dying so that we could be spiritually rich. Remembering that should cause us to give our time, our money, our gifts, our abilities to those who may need it. Remembering The joy that Jesus had in affliction should enable our joy and contentment in him through the hardest of times. And remembering the past of what God has done in redeeming us and in all that he has bought through Christ should ready us to have faith for the future troubles that are to come. We need to come back to Christ. We need to come back to remembering our redemption and all that we have in him 
all that we have by being united with Christ, all the spiritual blessings that come by being in him, we need to remember it to be equipped and ready for God's service. Well, we've seen here in Joshua 5 how God has prepared his people. And now, now they are ready for what God has ahead for them. And verse 12, 11 and 12 show a big turning point. Have a look, verse 11 and 12. It says, The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. The manna stopped the day after they ate this food from the land. There was no longer any manna for the Israelites, but that year they ate the produce of Canaan. This is a key turning point and a key moment in Israel's history. They finally eat the produce of the land. A new time has come. They are in the new land with a new diet. And so the manna stops because God is fulfilling his promises. Three times it says here, really emphasizes it. It says they ate the produce of the land to reaffirm that God has kept his promise. They are going in and they are going to conquer the land and inhabit the promised land. And this is what the rest of the book shows. And God is keeping his promise. And what hope should this should give us too? That God keeps his promises. For the Christian, for the Christian, we know that we will be united with God in eternity. We know that we have no condemnation. We know that we have an eternal weight of glory that far outweighs all the troubles here that is waiting for us. We know that our bodies will be redeemed and made new. We should long for this. We should long for this and we need to realize and remember that there are many great things that are to come in the promised land of eternal life with God. And so because of this, we need to not get caught up by the fleeting pleasures, the fleeting manner of this life. But what allowed all these blessings to come to the people of Israel? What was needed before they could go and conquer the land, before they could go in God's service, before they could receive the promised land and these great blessings. What must happen before we can do what God has ahead of us, before we can serve him? Well, the four things we saw in our passage, firstly, that God must prepare the way. Secondly, that we must be God's holy people. Third, that reproach must be removed. And fourth, We must remember our redemption. And really these four points, these four points really sum down to two. They really sum down to holy living and a trust in God, faith and obedience. Success would not have come to the Israelites if these things had not been done. God needed to grow their faith and obedience ready for the battle ahead. And we need this. I need this. I want to rush to things. I want to rush to doing the next thing. But God needs to equip and prepare me in these ways so much more before I just keep rushing to things. We need to trust in God. We need this trust in God. And we need holy living because they are the only way to be effective in God's service. We may be efficient in doing things in life, but we won't be effective for God's kingdom without these things. So ask yourself, what does your serving of God look like? Do you just rush into it? What does life look like? Do you just rush into it? What is your life grounded on? Is it grounded on faith and obedience? Is every moment characterized by a trust in God and a desire for holy living? I could tell you to do certain things now to try and grow your faith and to grow your obedience. But instead, I want you, after tonight, to just take the time out to ensure that God has readied you for what he has ahead. Rather than me telling you what to do, I challenge you to set aside the time tonight and seek for God to show you what must be done to grow faith and holy living in you. Don't rush 
to just doing the next thing that is ahead of you. But instead, seek to cultivate a life of holiness and dependence on God if you want to be effective in his service. For me, as an example, it is clinging to God in prayer and in the wisdom of his word and gaining this each morning before I rush into everything that the day holds. Faith and obedience in my life would flee quickly if I didn't spend time with God on my knees, in prayer, and in his word, daily reminded of his promises and the challenges he gives me. Faith in him and holy living would be gone in my life like that if I didn't have These things strengthening me. And sometimes faith and holy living are gone in my life because I neglect time with God in his word and prayer and the wisdom that he can give. So for me, that is how I seek to cultivate a life of holiness and dependence upon God. And may you do the same. May you seek the things that are needed to cultivate this life of trust, dependence upon God and holy living so that we are effective for God's service in this life. Let's pray. Our great God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Old Testament and this passage here and how it is still so relevant and convicting for us, God. We pray that even these simple challenges of faith, of the need for holy living, we pray that they wouldn't just brush over our minds, God, but that we would see our desperate need to do these things and to live in this way. May you remind us, God, of these things and how we need to prepare before rushing into stuff, before rushing into your service. Please ready us for your service, God, in the way that we have seen that you readied the Israelites. Please do this in us, God, and equip us to be effective in this life for your glory. And now, may God himself the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. That was 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 21, 23 to 24. God bless you, church, and I look forward to sharing again with you in the future. 